All right, so that's the prosecution's closing argument in the Cody Lott case. We did receive a verdict. I'm not going to let you know what that is just yet because let's break down how the prosecution was doing right there. And joining me, I have a very special guest, criminal defense attorney and civil rights attorney, Natalie Jackson. Natalie, great to have you back here on Law and Crime. Thank you for having me. So how's he doing? How'd the prosecution do in their closing argument? This is a, a really tough case from a lot of different angles. Yeah, this is a case where um, Cody Lott, he admitted that he did it, and he's relying on the insanity defense. So the prosecution at this point, what he has to do is show that this was not insanity at the moment that it was committed. This was someone who was mad, and not legally mad, but just mad as in out of his mind and just doing crazy things. So. I think the prosecution is doing a really good job in focusing on the victim in this case and focusing on the victim's family and Cody Lott's um, reasoning. Well, I I'll tell you, what we're going to show in a little bit is the back and forth between the defense's expert and the prosecution's expert about sanity. But before we do that, let's play now the defense's closing argument. Let's go. All right, so that was some of the defense's closing argument. I'm back here with Natalie Jackson. Natalie? We're hearing that the defendant made a lot of bizarre statements, but I'm curious your perspective about those statements. Well, I think um, the uh, defense attorney, I think he made a mistake in tying in the drugs to the insanity, because I think jurors have a hard time um, with voluntarily taking drugs and insanity. In this case, the I understand what he was doing, because for, for murder, you have to have malice and ill will. So if Cody Locke was thinking he was doing good in the world at the time, then that does support an insanity defense. All right. Well, the moment has arrived, Natalie. We are talked a little bit about the prosecution. We talked a little bit about the defense. What did the jury ultimately come back with? Did they find him guilty or not guilty by reason of insanity? Here's the verdict. All right, so that's one of the officers who was on scene at the time of the shooting. Let's bring in our own expert right now, law enforcement expert, and our very own host here on Law and Crime, Vincent Hill. Vincent, great to have you. Always a pleasure, Jesse. Vincent, i got to ask you probably the most important question. If he is not found guilty, what's going to happen in Chicago? Well, Jesse, quite frankly, it won't be good. If you think back to Ferguson and what we saw in Ferguson and Baltimore, back during Freddie Gray and Michael Brown. I see that happening here in Chicago if Van Dyke is acquitted. I mean, we got Jesse Jackson on the scene. A lot of people are watching this all across the country. We are watching it here on Law and & Crime. Let's talk to Natalie Jackson right now about one of the legal aspects of this. The fact that the, the victim was holding a knife and there was PCP in his system, which is what we learned from earlier testimony, how does that play in both for the prosecution and the defense? Well, I think that it really helps the defense in this case um, because you hear that he's on drugs and PCP is a drug that's associated with aggressiveness um, because of the Rodney King case. Um, the, I, I think that it does not help the prosecution. However, we have to remember that this is a question of what happened at the moment the shots were fired. And that's important. What happened at the moment these shots were fired? Let's play the testimony of Xavier Torres, another witness who was there and saw the shooting. And you said that you saw Laquan McDonald walking. Yes. Where was he when you first saw him walking? So he was in the middle of the street. Okay. Middle of, uh, what Pulaski. street was that? This bus, Pulaski. Okay. Uh, and was anything blocking your view of him? No. Okay. Uh, what did he do after you first saw him? Uh, I just seen him walking uh, southwest uh, towards the fence. Okay. Now you described the fence. Uh, where is that fence located? Uh, the fence is located on the uh, opposite side of the street uh, from where we were at. We were heading north mile. Okay. And how tall was that fence? I'd say it's about like six feet. Okay. And was there anything on the fence? Yeah, there's like a, a green tarp, I believe. So it's like a chain link fence that has a green like construction tarp over it? That's correct. Now, you said that Laquan McDonald was walking southwest. Uh, was that directly in the direction of any of the police officers on scene? No. Uh, could you describe uh, how he appeared when he was walking? Uh, yeah, he just had like a, just kind of a weird walk, just walking away from uh, the scene. Okay. Uh, 
And when you say a, a weird walk, can you just describe it? Just like a, a hop to his walk, kind of. Yeah. So it was a little bouncy? Yeah. Huh. <laughs> At some point, uh, do you hear uh, gunshots? Uh, yes. Okay. And where is the Plot McDonald when you hear uh, gunshots? Uh, it's towards, uh, it's kind of when he was walking towards the fence. Okay, so he was walking in a southwestern direction? Yes. Uh, and you hear gunshots? Yes. Uh, what happens after you hear gunshots? Uh, after I hear gunshots, uh, I just see him you know, just fall to the ground. Can you imagine having to testify and talk about the moments that this 17-year-old was shot and killed? We're trying to understand what happened that night. Back here with Vincent Hill. Vincent, we were talking in the break about the taser unit. One of the right. weird things about the crime scene was that a taser unit was brought in to subdue the victim, but Jason Van Dyke shot him anyway. Yeah, now, what's important about the taser unit, Jesse, is keep in mind the officers did not have to call a taser unit there. And the reason I say that is because Laquan was armed with a knife, which is considered a deadly force weapon, right? If someone gets stabbed by a knife, they could be killed by that knife. They did not necessarily have to call, call the taser unit down there, but I think what happened, those officers that were there before Van Dyke saw that Laquan was not acting in any aggressive manner where they thought their life was in imminent danger. And that's why they called the taser unit. Laquan, uh, you know, we talk about Laquan and Natalie. The question is aggressive behavior. Holding a knife, acting erratically, he was walking in the opposite direction of the officers. How does the defense argue that away? Because that's a huge point against them. Well, I think one of the points that was made with the testimony of Mr. Torres is that he didn't see the gut, the knife in um, McDonald's hand, in Laquan's hand. So by that point of saying that his testimony is not really valid because he didn't see everything and he didn't have the angle that officers had. We've had officers say that um, Laquan turned towards the officers while during the shooting. So that's their reasoning for saying that he was aggressive towards them and they had to worry about their life. Now, whether or not the jury believes that. And, and Vincent, at what point does is something deadly uh, a deadly threat? The fact that he was merely holding a knife? Is it the whether it was sheathed or unsheathed? Is it whether he was walking away from officers? When do officers categorize something as a threat? Well, if there's that imminent threat. So say, for instance, we saw on dash cam that Laquan was approaching an officer with a stabbing motion. At that exact second, it becomes an imminent threat against their life and they can use deadly force. The problem here, Jesse, is when we see that dash cam video, you see Laquan just kind of walking to the right, walking away. His hands are kind of to his side, so he's not in an aggressive manner to justify to say, oh, there was an imminent threat against my life, my partner's life, or the public's life. And, and Natalie, one of the biggest obstacles, I would say, for the defense is the fact that one officer shot him and shot him multiple times. It wasn't just one shot and that was it. Right. And that, that's usually the case in these type of um, cases where you have a police shooting. Um, you have one officer who shot. Well, the defense usually points out to the fact that this is the officer that had the greatest vantage point of what was happening. That's usually one of the defenses that is given. And you're going to hear a lot about the vantage point and who saw what and at what angle in this case. Oh, yeah. I mean, that is such a key aspect of this. And we are going to be live in this case today. We're keeping a very careful eye on that courtroom feed. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about the testimony revolving around Laquan McDonald's death. We'll be right back. All right, that's an interesting cross-examination. Natalie, what was the defense attorney trying to get at there with this nurse on the stand about the ability to resuscitate or ability to save Laquan McDonald? Um, show that, that Laquan McDonald was dead at the scene. So that's an important part because then you put in really when was the, when the bullets hit Laquan McDonald, was he already dead when the secondary well, when the, the bullets that hit him when he was down, was he already dead or was he alive? That's important because if he was dead, then there is no aggravated assault because he was already dead. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is where the defense is going. And this is why the prosecution is so upset and trying to get in that, no, he was not dead. He was alive and he was actually, he went to the hospital and they were trying to resuscitate him. 
So that is why it is very important that he was shot 16 times. Because so, yeah, no, I was going to say, some of it seems counterintuitive. Why do you have to ask these questions? But each one is important to prove a different fact and a different element. Vincent, i got to ask you, we talk so much about the victim and family and the public, but for officers and the law enforcement community, what is this verdict, when it's ultimately rendered, what does it mean to them? Well, you know, first I will say no officer wants to leave their home that day and go out and kill someone. Contrary to what you see, police are human. They have families. They empathize with victims. There was plenty, countless times where I had to pull my weapon. Thankfully, I did not have to shoot anyone. But I cannot imagine having to do that and then having to live with myself because police are not robots. So outside of that, all of law enforcement, especially in the city of Chicago, yes, they may feel empathy for Laquan McDonald and his family. You heard testimony from these officers that say they didn't see a threat there. But also, they feel the empathy for Van Dyke, mm -hmm. for what he's going through emotionally. Because at the end of the day, it is very emotional when you take someone's life. Whether you're trained to do it, whether you're authorized to do it, it's still very emotional. Well, clearly, no matter which side you're on here, there's a lot at stake with this trial, and there's a lot at stake with this verdict. We are going to be live in that courtroom today, so you don't want to miss anything. We will take a quick break, but we'll be right back. A lot to discuss. All right, the medical examiner testifying there in the Jason Van Dyke case, huge, really huge. Um, I'm back here with Natalie Jackson. Natalie, the, the idea that one officer fired the weapon and that there were multiple gunshots and not just one shot and then that the jury is hearing about the gunshots, the, the wounds sustained by the victim, what is this doing for them? I think that it's really bringing into light that, you know, this was, and I think what the prosecution is trying to do is to show that this body was riddled with bullets. You have 24 exit and entry wounds. Um, and once again, the timing of which each gunshot entered the body is important. And it's important to whether or not this is murder or, and whether or not each of the 16 um, aggravated assault charges will stick. So I think that this is really important testimony. I think the jury might be confused on why they're hearing it, but I'm sure the prosecution and the defense will bring this home in closing. Well, we have more of the medical examiner to play after our short break. And when we get back, we're going to talk about a controversial witness that testified yesterday and who actually came on the stand twice. We'll be right back right after this. Stay tuned. Welcome back, everybody. We're talking about all of our live trials that we are going to be covering here today, and there's a lot to talk about. But before we go into a discussion about any of those cases, there is always, always so many stories happening across the country, and we want to talk about it right now. So here are the top stories trending across the country. Here are today's top crime stories trending on lawandcrime.com and across the country. Christian Rivera, the suspect accused of killing University of Iowa student Molly Tibbetts, pleaded not guilty to murder charges. Rivera, an undocumented Mexican national, reportedly killed Tibbetts before hiding her body in a secluded location. Molly Tibbetts went missing in July, and her body was discovered after Rivera told authorities her location. Rivera faces life in prison if convicted of first-degree murder, and his trial is scheduled for April 16th of next year. The Tennessee girl, abducted by her former teacher for 38 days, sat down to discuss the ordeal in her first on-air interview. Elizabeth Thomas was 15 years old when she was reportedly abducted by her former health sciences teacher, 52-year-old Tad Cummings. Authorities discovered the pair living in a shack deep inside a wooded area in Northern California. During the interview, Thomas recounted the first inappropriate interaction she had with Cummings. Whenever he first kissed me, that was whenever I realized this is getting too far. How did he make that move? He grabbed my face. In his classroom? Yes. Cummings pleaded guilty to kidnapping charges. A judge in California dismissed part of actress Ashley Judd's lawsuit against disgraced Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein. Judd can still move forward with the lawsuit, but the judge dismissed her sexual harassment claim. 
Weinstein has been accused by 80 women, including A-list actresses such as Judd, of sexual misconduct. Prosecutors in Los Angeles currently have five open cases against Weinstein. The allegations against Weinstein helped launch the hashtag MeToo movement on social media, encouraging victims to tell their stories of sexual harassment and abuse. Weinstein is also under investigation in New York and London for alleged sex crimes. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for Law & Crime. Thank you, Anthony. You can go to lawandcrime.com to learn a little bit more of the top trending stories. But I want to talk with Natalie Jackson right now about the Ashley Judd case. So, Natalie, I'm confused. Her sexual harassment claim seems like the biggest one in her whole complaint. How is that not permitted to go forward? Well, it actually wasn't the biggest in the complaint. It was the biggest in the public eye. But under California law, you have to have a professional relationship with someone to claim sexual harassment. Here, the judge said that this was a prospective relationship. So it would be unprecedented to allow her to go forward with a sexual harassment claim since they were not in a, in a, relation, a professional relationship, an employee-employer relationship at the time. I can hear the groans from a lot of people out there when they get upset that the law gets in the way of these kinds of things. But is this something that she could maybe uh, amend in a new complaint and maybe change it because this is a probably a fluid and flexible area of the law. I'm imagining in, in light of everything that we're seeing with the Me Too movement. Well, I think that I understand um, how many people are frustrated, but the California law is really clear and it prohibits harassment in a professional service or business relationship. Here, Ashley Judd is accusing Harvey Weinstein of sexual harassment in when he invited her to his hotel room. They weren't, there wasn't a movie being made. It was just talking about possibly working together at some point. So, um, But do you think it's a good idea to expand that definition, maybe in California and maybe in New York, where the entertainment industry is big and these kind of prospective relationships happen? Or is it a danger because the, the more you create that kind of uh, umbrella, it, it might make a problem in terms of what is sexual harassment and what is not if those kind of definitions of the relationships are unclear? Yeah, well, I think that um, under the law, it's what the legislators thought. You want to make the law as narrow and as specific as possible so that people know when they're breaking the law. So I think in this case, you know, it, it will really depend on the climate of California and their legislators on whether or not this should be expanded. And I agree with you that you do possibly take into, take into consideration needs. There's the need to take into consideration the um the industries in California. But here, I think that the judge made the right call based on the law. And I know that she has a bunch of other uh, causes of action within that complaint, and perhaps she will file an amended complaint and something will be different. But her case is not over. She's still pursuing Harvey Weinstein on other kinds of causes of action. So, Natalie, we will look, we'll learn a little bit more about that. And if we have an update, we'll make sure to discuss about it. But we want to switch gears here. And, and talk more about one of our live trials, and that's the Jason Van Dyke case. Uh, we were covering this one earlier. We're going to continue covering it now because we are going to be live in that courtroom today. Where we last left off, we were talking about the medical examiner who was discussing the injury sustained by 17-year-old Laquan McDonald. Here's where the medical examiner talks more about the blood loss. Wow. That was a really big piece of testimony, hearing that the victim was alive for every one of the gunshots. That's huge, and the jury just heard it. But this witness is not the only big witness that we've heard so far in this case. We've also heard a controversial witness, uh, FBI expert Mark Messick. Uh, Natalie Jackson's back with us. There was controversy surrounding this witness, correct, about what he could testify to and what he couldn't testify to in terms of this video breakdown of that dash cam footage. Can you elaborate a little bit more on it? Yes. Um, there was The judge ultimately threw out this testimony based on the fact that this witness was not qualified as a ballistic ex expert to testify as to the gunshots on the scene. Um, and so that was the that was the the reason that this witness was thrown out. However, the judge did give the prosecution a do-over by, by providing an expert that who could testify to the ballistics. You know, sitting on that jury is never easy, and I'm sure it gets confusing at times, especially for this. You know, these kinds of errors, we hope we don't see them because it just confuses the jury. Back here with Vincent Hill, though, Vincent, one of the big areas of this case that I couldn't help but explore. 
Van Dyke has a weird history. He's faced a series of complaints and even lawsuits. So listening to that, this isn't this guy's first uh, uh, issue with, with uh, you know, force. And he's been accused of a lot of things in the past. What do you make of that? Well, I question why he was even still on the department at this point. I mean, complaint after complaint, lawsuit after lawsuit, that costs the city money. It makes the city look bad. So why keep a guy like that around? Again, I never wanted Monday morning quarterback and officer's decisions sure. having been in that position where I have to make split-second decisions. Right. But if you have all of this back history here, at some point you just need to cut your losses and say, hey, you are a detriment to this department. We no longer need you. Your services are no longer required here. I'm sure that's a discussion that's happening right now about why he was still employed. Right. And perhaps Laquan McDonald could still be alive today. Speaking of Laquan McDonald, we're talking about the injury sustained, but that's not the only thing that the medical examiner analyzed. She also analyzed the drugs that was in his system. Take a look. Ooh, okay, so this is an interesting area to explore now as well. Back here with Natalie Jackson. Natalie, the drugs in his system, that's an avenue I would imagine the defense really wants to explore. Oh, definitely. But I think it's really interesting. I think the prosecution has an opportunity here, too, because the initial drug testing came back that he had nothing in his system, but it only tested for certain opioids and cannabis. So the prosecution actually requested another an extended drug screening and that's when the PCP was found so I think the prosecution could actually use this in their favor that look they're trying to really get to the heart of what happened as opposed to just trying to win a case yeah that's one way to look at it uh, another way to look at it is Vincent Hill our law enforcement expert here when you hear that about the victim having this in his system does it affect your decision or what do you think about it well when you're there in that exact moment, Jesse, you don't know if someone's under the influence of an intoxicant. You can speculate all you want based on their signs and their symptoms of being under the influence, but you don't know in that exact moment. But more importantly than that, since Laquan did have PCP in his system, which it does alter your mind state, if I was the family, if I was an attorney, I would be tracking down who sold this young boy, this PCP, to alter his mind state to even go out and do what he did. I mean, let's back up before the shooting. He was out acting a little bit erratic, mm -hmm. probably uh, because of the, the side effects of the PCP. So I would be tracking that person down too, and I'd have them in that courtroom as well. You know, Natalie, we talk about the victim. He is the victim. He's no longer with us. He was a 17-year-old kid. How dangerous is it for the defense to keep exploring the, the illegality of what he was doing, having the knife, drugs in his system, acting erratically. You don't want to lose the jury on that, right? Well, many times you don't lose the jury, and that's why the defense does exploit it. Um, but I think it's up to the prosecution to remind the jury that, you know, the law protects victims, both saints and sinners. So here, it really is an issue of what happened at the time Laquan McDonald was shot, and what was, what was the officer, was Officer Van Dyke in fear of deadly force at that time? So in other words, everything that he was doing beforehand, don't distract us. Right. So, And I think that is what the prosecution needs to really hammer on. And I think that they've done a brilliant job of charging this case because they've made it so that if the jury decides that it's not murder because the kill shot happened during a time where perhaps Officer Van Dyke was in fear of his life or fear of someone else's life, then they may not be able to come back with murder. But while um, McDonald was on the ground and he was being shot and the bullets were discharging while he was no longer a threat, then the 16 counts of aggravated assault comes into play here. And, so and, I do. And that's why it's so important when he died, you know, and that, that he felt every shot. So. Exactly. Uh, yeah, we're, we're going to have to cover this one more. We have to take a quick break, but we are going to be live in that courtroom today. We don't know which way this trial is going to go, but we're watching it. Gavel to gavel, minute to minute, second to second. We'll be right back. All right, so that was a controversial witness. The defense said this guy is not a ballistics expert. Those use of the green hours are inappropriate, and his use of the video was also prejudicial. We'll talk more about Mark Messick in a minute. But one of the good points, points that Natalie Jackson brought up to us in, in break was the idea that the other officers who are involved in this shooting, they're in hot water. Let's talk a little bit more about that, Natalie.
police officers who were indicted um, on charges of conspiracy and obstruction of justice in this case. That's important because here you have officers testifying. Usually when officers testify, they pretty much testify together in, um, in coverance of each other. But in this case, officers have to really be careful. And this is the first time we've seen this, where officers have to be careful about their testimony because the state has shown, the prosecution has shown, shown that they will prosecute perjurers. And so this is really important. And it's pretty much landmark as far as I've seen from these type of cases. You know, Vincent, we're not just talking about one officer now in the Chicago Police Department. We're talking about multiple. What do you think about that? Well, you know what it's going to come down to is what they wrote in those reports, initial, those officers there on the scene. We heard testimony from a, a few officers in this case, but I believe there were other officers that, worked, uh, that wrote reports saying something that's contradictory to what we see on that dash cam footage. And if that is the case, then they should be prosecuted for those charges, for those conspiracy charges. Because the one thing you cannot do as an officer is lie. The one thing I held more importantly than anything in my job as a police officer was my integrity. Mm -hmm. The minute that's gone, the public loses, loses faith in you. It's over. Well, I have no doubt about your integrity as an officer and a law enforcement expert and a host here on Law and Crime. Thank you. Um, so here's what's going to happen right now. We have just gotten a word that we are going to be live in the Cody Lot penalty phase after our short break. We believe Michaela Smith's mother is on the stand. This is the mother of the surviving victim in that horrible shooting. He was found guilty across the board. We will cover more of that case right after this break. You don't want to miss anything here on Law and Crime. Stay tuned. All right, everybody, that is Shamika Smith. She is the mother of surviving victim Michaela Smith, talking about when she got the phone call from her daughter that she was shot and that her friend Lauren was not moving. I'm back here with Natalie Jackson. Natalie, this is the penalty phase. Cody Lott was found guilty of murder and aggravated assault, faces anywhere between 5 to 99 years in prison or life in prison. How does this penalty phase work? Yeah, well, the penalty phase is when the they have the um, victims testify and anyone who can testify to provide information on whether or not um, there are any aggravating factors or mitigating factors in this in in this case and so you'll have um witnesses put on with mitigating factors also this is an aggravating factor witness and then it's up to the jury to decide what penalty will be in this case but how do they choose 99 years or life in prison Where, what is that difference the um the difference in this case would be really based on the aggravating and mitigating factors and the um what is presented to the jury yeah, either way, it's, it would be a life sentence for him. I mean, the really controversial thing would be if they gave him uh, a sentence where he could be released or there was early parole. Uh, we don't know. We don't know which way they'll go. We don't know which way the defense will explore because obviously the insanity defense didn't work in the guilt or innocence phase, but maybe they'll explore it in the penalty phase. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody. So that was a key witness for the prosecution in this penalty phase. Back here with Natalie Jackson. What did that witness, the mother of the surviving victim, what did that do for the jury just there, Natalie? Yeah, that brings the case to, that makes it real. Now you have mothers and you have victims testifying. You don't have that in the trial portion of, in the, um, the, the, the litigation part of a trial because you don't want to bring sympathy into a trial. However, in the sentencing phase, now you can bring in the aggravating circumstances and the mitigating circumstances. One interesting thing about Texas is that a defendant can opt for the jury to decide the sentence. Now, that doesn't happen in any federal trial, and in most states, the judge will decide the sentencing. So this is interesting. This witness is providing testimony to the jury who will then decide um, the fate of Mr. Lott. I don't know if that was a good idea or not, considering the jury found him guilty of murder and aggravated assault, but we'll have to see. Okay, we have just got an update that a new witness is on the stand. This is Lauren Lendavazo's father. Let's go. Tim Lexington. 
All right, we're hearing testimony from family and friends in the penalty phase of the Cody Lott case. Have to sign off, Natalie Jackson. Natalie, thank you so much for being on the program with us. Thanks for having me, Jesse. Have a good day. You too. All right, everybody, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to be live. Stay tuned here on Law & Crime.